All right, prayer. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a speaker into your heart that breaks you. And somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. This morning, we are finishing our series, If My People, uh, we've been talking about five principles of transformational prayer life. And in this series, we've looked at these two passages of scripture. It's 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, where it's the dedication of the temple. The, the, the people of Israel are dedicating God's house, essentially. Uh, and uh, God gives them this promise in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, as well as we've been looking at this way that Jesus taught us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's in Matthew 6. And in these, both of these prayers or both of these uh, passages of scriptures, we see these five elements of transformational prayer or these five principles, right? We see adoration, which is our worship of God. We see submission, which is our submitting to his will for our lives. We see petitions, the things that we ask God to do on our behalf. We see repentance, right? It's, it's, it's again, it's turning our character to God. It's, it's turning away from sin, as well as forgiving other people their sins. And today, today we're going to talk about this fifth principle of protection and restoration. Several years ago, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and I decided that I was going to buy my dream car which was a 1998 Jeep Cherokee <laughs> and it's kind of a piece of junk. But here's the thing. I had these grand visions that I was going to take this old junker and restore it and put a three inch lift on it and fat tires. And that I was going to drive it wherever I wanted to go through the mud, through more mud, <laughs> flinging it everywhere. It's going to be a blast. I was so excited about this and I did it. Right? I, I, I saved up a little bit of money and I found this dirt cheap Jeep on the internet and I bought it and I drove it home and I was so excited. This Jeep was nothing but problems. Like the time I was driving it and a tire fell off because apparently you can over tighten lug nuts and it strips them. Here's the thing, right? There's, there's a problem with Jeep Cherokees that is kind of a death sentence for them and it's rust. It's a unibody frame, which means you can't really separate like the top part from the bottom part. It's all one piece. And if you get rust in your frame, you're done. Your structural integrity has gone. Like it, it is the death sentence for a Jeep. And when I bought it, I didn't really know what I was looking for. And it had a significant amount of rust on it. In fact, the more like pieces I would take off, the more would just like rust would just fall on the ground. And so I tried my best to do what I could to fix it. And I would, I would cut off, <laughs> I would spend hours in my driveway with a grinder, just cutting off portions that I was going to retack fresh metal on. I bought this chemical. It was supposed to help stop the, the growth of rust. But in all this process of me trying to fix and restore this Jeep, I ran into a problem. And that's that I lived in Georgia. And while we don't get that much rain here, in Georgia, there's a lot of rain, which happens to be what causes rust. At the time, we had a two-car garage, and it was our third car. And if I'm real honest, one of those garage bays was taken up by boxes anyway. And so there were two cars sitting out, and there's no way the Jeep was inside while the other cars were outside. And so I was trying to restore something without effectively protecting it from the thing that endangered it in the first place. You can imagine how successful I was. I eventually ended up selling the Jeep just because it was not worth the hassle anymore. And I am very excited to tell you that there's another crappy old one that sits in my driveway right now because I just still think they're awesome. This one does do a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> Here's the problem though, right? I couldn't restore it without protecting it. And when we're looking at this series and you're like, hey, he keeps talking about protection and restoration as a principle, 
That, that seems like two principles to me, right? That's two words. All the rest of like the prayer guides were like one word. Protection and restoration is two words. Well, this is why, right? Protection and restoration are often viewed as one principle in scripture. And if you really are a stickler and like, no, I'm pretty sure it's two, they're at least the principles, they are in tandem. And I want to show you real quick before we jump into the prayer aspects of it today, where we see restoration and protection as one principle in scripture. So we're going to go through a lot of scripture really quickly. I've tried to color code it on the slides to help, help make it more understandable. So if you look at it, restoration pa- p- uh, words in, in these passages of scripture are going to be orange and protection is going to be green, right? So we're going to move through this really quickly. Again, if you want uh, to get this full list of verses, text LH notes to the, to the number and, or, or you can click notes in your bulletin and you can see the full list of these scriptures there, right? So here we go. Psalm 51, 12, it says this, restore, restoration, obviously, restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit, right? That's restoration and uphold me is protection. Look at this in Amos chapter nine, verse 14, right? I will, and this God saying this to the people of Israel, I will restore to you, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. <clears throat> cities, ancient cities were places of protection, right? You can't live in a ruined city because it doesn't offer protection. Restored cities, rebuilt cities are protective mechanisms. They shall plant the vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. Look at this in Galatians 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if any of you is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But then there's personal protection in here too. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And maybe the greatest example I can think of this in scripture is in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. Now, real quick, I believe Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of the most misquoted passages of scripture ever, right? We take it out of context often. So before we do that, just real quick, this passage was written to the people of Israel who were living in exile. They've been, all of Jerusalem, all of Israel had been attacked. They were sacked. The city was sacked. People were taken into slavery. The people of Israel are living in exile. They are not living in God's in the promised land right now. They're not living in Jerusalem. And so this is the promise in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, right? Welfare is restoration, not for evil. There's protection there. To give you future and to hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. I will bring you back to this place, to Jerusalem, to the place of security and protection. Right, so we see these two principles of protection and restoration. What we really see is where God protects, he also restores. And where God, what God restores, he also protects, right? They work in tandem, they work together. So with that, this morning, I want to look at these passages of scripture because here's the truth. I feel very confident that there are people in this room that have felt the attack of Satan in their lives. They feel like you've, you, some of you may have felt like you've lost something or you're grieving a sin or a pain because something was taken away from you. So this morning, I want to walk through how we pray this protection and restoration in our lives. So Matthew 6, starting in verse 9, right? Again, this is the same prayer that we've been walking through. It's the same prayer that Jesus taught us how to pray. It says this, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. There's your adoration. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's the submission on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. There's our petition. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. There's repentance. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Likewise, when we look at 2 Chronicles 7, this this passage we've been looking at in tandem with this, 
It, we see this passage. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. And so those last three words, heal their land, that we see is this concept of restoration. So it's protection and restoration. And I believe if we can learn how to pray these principles into our lives daily, that it will make a significant difference. In fact, I believe if we can pray these five principles, it will transform your life. So let's look at it this morning. What does it mean to pray protection? And what is it protecting us from? The first thing that we see is that It actually protects us to something. It protects us to the pursuit of God. In this passage, it says, lead us not into temptation, right? In this this phrase, lead us not into temptation is a request for God's involvement in avoiding sin. This is what I mean by that, right? Often churches, including ours, use this language uh, talking about sin. And it's this concept that sin separates us from God. And it's true, it does. But I think that, that if we're not careful, it can lead us to viewing God as the end goal, right? God is the thing we receive at the end. And sin is the thing we have to overcome to get him. And so, and so sin, we've got to take care of our own personal problem with sin in order for us to, to get to God, which is the goal. And that's not what we see in scripture. And so I I think if we're not careful that we mistake God for the end goal and sin as just our own personal battle that we have to overcome. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right? It tells us very clearly the way we overcome sin is not on our own, but with God. God's not just the goal. He's involved in the process. And whatever sin you're struggling with or whatever sin you're dealing with, it's not something that you are intended to battle with alone. God moves on your behalf. There's a relationship that we have with God in order to overcome sin so that we can have a relationship with him. In fact, praying Protection is also praying the avoidance of temptation, right? It also affirms our personal growth to be more like Jesus. Why shouldn't we sin? Because we're pursuing Jesus. We want to be more like God. Does anybody in the room not want to be more like God? Cool. Anybody online? I can't see your hands, but I'm assuming nobody's raising their hands online either. You know why? Because we would be in the wrong place if we didn't want to be more like God, right? Like we want to be more like him. We want to live lives, godly, holy, righteous lives. That's one of the reasons why we're here. And so when we talk about protecting our pursuit of God, avoiding sin helps us be more like Jesus. And here's the cool part. God helps us avoid sin. So when we're praying protection, we're praying sin avoidance as we pursue God. The other thing that it does is it protects us from the conditions of a broken world. Praying protection is protecting us from those conditions. When I got my very first iPhone way back in 2008, I remember I I was so excited. I saved up my money. It was like the the, the second iPhone that came out, the first one. The second one was like the iPhone 3G, and I was so excited to have it. And I saved up my money and I bought it and it was like my shiny new toy. And I remember I was getting out of my car in a parking garage in Tyler, Texas, doing a hospital visit of all things. And it fell out of my pocket and landed screen down on the concrete and shattered it. And I was so upset because I broke my brand new phone. Here's the thing. Over the last however many years now, many of us have broken many phones. But when you have a phone that has a shattered screen on it, most of the time it'll still work. The problem is there's nothing protecting you from cutting your finger or face. Anybody struggle with that ever? Like cut my finger open because my phone is broken and like there's nothing protecting my finger. Uh, Last weekend we went camping and we have an iPad, an old iPad that we play music for our kids for so they can go to sleep. Uh, and it has a shattered screen and I picked it up in the middle of the night and I ran my finger over to unlock it. And like, 
my finger dug a piece of that shattered screen out and it was stuck in my finger because nothing was protecting my finger from the glass. Now, before they had these fancy screen protectors and an iPhone fix-it store around every corner, you just like put that clear piece of tape over it and like that would protect you enough. But here's the thing, when you don't have protection from things that are broken, sometimes you get hurt. We live in a broken world. People ask me as a pastor often, why would God allow bad things to happen? And I don't think it's because God allows bad things to happen. I think that he's our hope in the conditions of a broken world. Bad things happen because we live in a broken world. Romans tells us that all of creation is yearning for its redemption. We find redemption in Jesus, but creation doesn't find that until Jesus returns for the second time. And so we live in a world that is broken, that is sinful. And we, just like our fingers, when we cut them on broken phones, we are going to have to live in the conditions of that broken world. Bad things are going to happen. First Peter, well, for, sorry, before we get to first Peter, right? Praying delivers from evil is asking for protection from the conditions that sin has brought to the world. First Peter 4 Chapter 12 says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. First Peter tells us, right? Peter himself, right? We should expect to be impacted by the sinful world. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked when bad things happen. But yet as Christians, sometimes we still live in this condition that we expect the lost world to act like they're in church. As Christians, we love boycotting people, right? I mean, I remember when I was a kid, like we boycotted Disney for something that happened at Disney. I don't even remember. I think we're boycotting Disney again now. Who knows? Here's what I know is that we as Christians have this expectation that the rest of the world live by our standards when they don't know Jesus. We don't expect the lost world to act lost. We expect them to act like us. And when they don't, we shun them. When Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not what you're supposed to do. You love them. Love those who persecute you. Jesus told us to go in the world and make disciples of all the nation. We should act, we should expect the lost world to act lost. Now, we as a church, though, we have the benefit of Jesus, but we still as Christians live in the conditions of a broken world. And so when we're praying for protection, we're praying that God protects us from those sinful conditions of the world. Bad things are still going to happen. Tragedy still occurs. Natural disasters still happen. Our loved ones still get sick and die. We're still impacted by our sins and the sins of other people. The world is still broken. And so when we pray, deliver us from evil, we're praying for protection from that broken world. When I was in high school, I went to a private Christian high school and had a, I had a Bible class every day. Uh, and my I had a Bible teacher named Mr. Halliday, and part of our, our grading system in Bible classes, we had to memorize scripture, which put a weird thing in my mind about memorizing scripture that I'm still trying to overcome. Uh, but some of the scripture I memorized was actually really impactful. And Mr. Halliday, a very godly man, um, had everyone in all of his classes memorize Psalm 91. And they memorized it not as not as just a, a scripture to recite, but, they, but we memorized it as a prayer. And I remember at the time him telling us that the, this is a prayer of protection and we should live lives where we're praying this. And this man, pray, I think he still does, prays this every single day over himself and his family. And so I want to read it for you today and just hear the words of protection in Psalm 91. This is what it says, right? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, right? Right from there, verse one, we already have protection. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks at darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. 
A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes you will look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil will be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. And this last part is a quote from God, right? Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a powerful, powerful passage of scripture. And Mr. Halliday believed if we could pray that every day, that we would have divine protection. And here's the thing, I'm inclined to believe him because that's also how Jesus taught us to pray. Deliver us from evil, protect us. We're asking God to intervene on our behalf to bring us protection, both spiritual and physical. And does that mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that we have an opportunity to turn our hearts to God and depend on him for grander protection and greater protection than we could ever provide for ourselves. Not only protection, but the other part of this principle is restoration. And when we pray this, it's restoring to us an identity that has been stolen by sin. The Reverend Timothy Keller, who pastors up in New York, a Redeemer a Presbyterian church, says that if, we identify, if, if our identity is in our work rather than Christ, success will go to our heads and failure will go to our hearts. If our whole identity is based on us and not Jesus, we think all the success is about us, but we think that all the failure is who we are. If you've ever felt that you weren't good enough to be a Christian or to be an active member in a church community, what you're doing is you've allowed the, de the devil to whisper in your ear and remind you of your sins and steal your identity in Jesus. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. But here's the thing. We are all born with this identity, this, self, this sense of self, this identity. It's me. And so much of our decisions, so many of our choices are based off of me identity. But what Jesus says is, I don't want you to identify by yourself. I want you to, to, to die to yourself. I want you to, 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 to take up your cross daily. That, that means be willing to die to who you are daily to follow him. Our identity is not based in us anymore. It's based in Jesus. It's not about who you are. It's about what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross. But here's the cool thing, right? What that means for us is that you're not defined by your sins, your hurts, or your failures. Your sins do not define you. Your failures do not define you. Your shame does not define you. This sense of brokenness is not who you are. John 1.12 tells us who, who we are. But to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, right? Who all, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You're not defined by your failures. You're not defined by that sin that, that you don't tell anybody about because you're so ashamed of it. That's not who you are. You are a child of God. And your identity doesn't come from you, it comes from him.
And maybe you sit there and go, well, Joel, I really don't feel like a new creation. I don't feel like, I believe in Jesus, but I don't feel like the old has passed away and the new has come. How, I think my response is, well, maybe that's why Jesus told us to include it in our prayers every single day. Because you are his child. You're part of the family of God. The next part I'm about to say may hurt your feelings, but let me qualify it for a second. If somehow you and I and my family get in a big brawl fist fight, and we're on one side, and there's a whole bunch of people we're fighting on the other side, and I've got to choose to protect someone, I'm going to choose to protect my children instead of you. Really sorry about that. But they're my kids, right? It's my family. I'm going to protect them. If I can protect you both, I will. But like, I would assume you would do the same. You'd let me take the punch to protect your own kids. At least I would hope you would. Or maybe some of you people who have adult kids have someone who's big and strong that can protect all of us, right? But, right, even though my kids get smart mouths with me and even though they mess up, even though they, they sin and say things to me that are hurtful, my little girl, the three-year-old, told me that she did not love me as much as she loved her mom the other day. That stung, but my wife's also pretty great, right? All right my kids do sinful things. My kids do bad things, but still in a moment of protection, my goal is, in my, like, my focus is to protect them. When we are part of God's family, we fall under his protection. Through Jesus, God restored our identity and included us in his family. We get his restoration and his protection. He tells us who we are. When we've denied ourselves to follow him, our identity is not in sin or failure or shame or hurt or our past or what we think about ourselves. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That is who you are. The other thing that we see with restoration, we pray this, is, is that we're praying that, that there's a restoring to us of what God values for us. And this, I want to show you this that we see in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, right? At the end of this passage, it says, and I will hear from heaven, forgive your sins and heal their land, right? This is God praying, right? Or this is God's response is if you humble yourself, turn to him, right? If we have adoration, if we have submission, if we have petition, if we have repentance, then God's going to hear from heaven. And he will heal the land. He will restore the land. Here's my question, though. Where did the people of Israel get that land? It's not a trick question. You can answer out loud. God, thank you. Thank you, Josh, right? It's the promised land. It's the land of promise that came from a covenant between God and the people of Israel. He said, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will give your descendants this land. Right? That was God's idea. That was not their idea. In fact, when they were coming out of Egypt from slavery, right? right we've all seen this, Ten Commandments, uh, Prince of Egypt, right? Charlton Heston goes and he gets the people out of slavery and he brings them into the wilderness, out, out of Egypt. I said Charlton Heston and nobody laughed at that. It was Moses. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, guys. I know it's Labor Day weekend. I don't know we're not supposed to be working, but wake up. Let's go. We're at the end here, right? Moses gets the people out of slavery in Egypt and he's in the wilderness. And the people are like, Moses, this is really hard. Can't we just go back? It was a lot easier. And Moses is like, no dummies, eat the man and shut up. And God got real mad and was like, fine, you're going to complain. You're all going to die in the wilderness. Your children can have the land I was going to give you. But it was not their idea. It was God's idea to give them this land of promise. Submitting to God's will also means to submitting to his restoration plans for our lives. Because sometimes we have grand ideas of who we should be. And when we're restored, we, we have a great idea of, hey, 2 Corinthians says, I'm a new creation. Like, I've got great ideas of what that new creation should look like. And God's saying, I'm, that's not who I've called you to be. 
We submit ourselves to God's restoration plans. You know, one of the things that my generation has just fallen in love with is this concept of flipping houses. Here's the problem though. There's a lot of people that like want to flip a house. They want to buy a rundown shack of an old house and flip it and make all sorts of money on it. There's lots of people who, who want to flip houses that don't have the skills required to flip a house. They don't know how to restore a house. And so what happens is they put band-aids over all the problems and hope the next owners don't notice during the inspection. Because as soon as those papers are signed, that's their problem. Right? And, and like, it's become prevalent. When Ashley and I were looking for houses and we were moving here, we, we found this one house and it was gorgeous. It was beautiful and it was priced right. And we're like, this has got to be it. We love this house. Call the realtor right now. Let's send the offer in. And then we went down to the haphazardly finished basement. And as I'm walking around on this basement, it feels like there's carpet on top of gravel. And it's kind of crunchy. And I'm like, what is going on down here? And we go over to the corner and peel up the carpet. And we realized what the previous owners, or I guess current owners, had done is they put float concrete on the top of a broken foundation. And anybody who's a professional in restoring foundations will know, like, all that's going to happen is that top level concrete is just going to crack and shatter and turn into rubble. Because you didn't actually restore the foundation. You didn't fix the actual problem. See, we, when we think that we're going to restore ourselves and we think that we've got an idea of what our identity should be, often it's like that. It's like floating concrete on something that's broken. Well, God's going, that's not who you are. Let me fix, let me restore to who I think you should be. See, true restoration requires expertise. And God is our restoration expert. And praying for his protection and restoration will lead us to be more like him. Not more like we, who we think we should be, more like him. Restoring us to what God values for us sometimes is not easy, sometimes it's not comfortable, it can be painful. But the end result is that we are better and that we will be more like Jesus. Over the process of this series, we've been, I've been asking you to pray and, and to practice these prayer steps every week. And the challenge that I gave you five weeks ago is, hey, I want you by the end of this to pray for one hour. And that came from a passage in scripture at the, at the, right before the crucifixion when Jesus is at the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's with his disciples and three of them and he asked them to go and to pray with him and they fell asleep and he gets mad. And he's like, could you not tarry with me for one hour? Could you not stay awake and alert and watch and pray with me for one hour? And so that's the challenge is to pray, actively pray for one hour. Because too often the way we approach prayer is that we go to eat after church, we sit down at fuzzies, we go rub it up, dub, thanks for the grub, and we dive in. Or we say like our little quick prayer, God bless me today, right? Here's the thing, right? I'm not saying we should stop praying before our meal. I'm not saying we should stop saying prayers in the morning or at night. We say short prayers like four times throughout our Sunday morning service. I'm not saying to stop any of that. What I'm saying is let's add a level of deep, intimate prayer with God. We pray to him and we listen to him. We've handed out these prayer guides every week and there's a the new one this week. It's on the table. Here's the thing. There's, there's a minute counter at the bottom of each of those. I'm not saying that's how long your prayer has to be. What I am saying is if it's a rough idea that if you pray on that specific, specific subject for that long, if you follow the whole thing at the end of it, you've been praying an hour. Our staff's been doing this a week ahead of everyone. So this past Tuesday was our like hour long prayer time. And, and I remember I was actually late coming back to it because like my prayer went over. I'm not saying that, that, that you have to go over. What I'm saying is when we can walk in that intimate relationship, in that conversation with God, time starts to not matter as much. And we can walk into life transformation. And we can pray these principles and see it make a difference. And man, 
I started doing this a little bit when, when I studied this last year, getting ready for the series. But as I've done it the past five weeks along with you guys, like it's been impactful. I have seen it in my life. And if you've been praying, I, I know you've seen it in yours as well. Here's the other thing. If you haven't done this, the great news is it's not too late. Just because the series over doesn't mean you stop praying. We have the resource available. We'll keep it available for it for you. Because I believe that if we can be a people of prayer, we're going to see God move in significant ways in our church and in our community. So the last prayer guide is out there. I pray that you take it. We've got all the others out there as well. If you need them, take them. If you need more, I'll print you more. But let's be a people of prayer. And let's learn how we can pray for adoration and worship God how we can submit to his will for our lives and align our hearts to his will so that we can bring whatever we have to him and that he will hear us. And then we can pray those moments of repentance where our character turns to God's will and that we can pray for his protection and restoration in our lives. And we can see the benefit of being men and women of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do worship you. God, I thank you for the, how you have designed prayer to work and the goodness of your glory in the middle of it all. Father, I pray that we as a people would align our hearts to your will, that we would not be stubborn, but that we would follow you wholeheartedly. God, for the, for the hurts, for the brokenness, for the pain, the things that seem as impossible for us to overcome, we give those to you and we ask that you move on our behalf. And for the moments where we have sinned, where we have pursued something that wasn't you, I pray that we repent and turn away from that. We ask for your forgiveness and we ask that you give us the ability and capacity to forgive other people. And as men and women who live in a broken world that's susceptible to sin, God, we ask that you protect us and where the, the enemy has robbed us, Lord, I pray that you restore to us. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.